The following is Class 9 on the Yoga Sutras, given by Ridayananda Das Goswami in fall of 2004 in San Luis Obispo. A description of the Vedas in general and Mantra 5 of Sri Ishopanishad will be discussed for the first 20 minutes. Then Sutras 240 to 248 will be covered. ...and the explanations and the meaning, the significance of fire sacrifices, which we read about also in Homer and the Iliad and the Odyssey, and all ancient cultures, they used to, including the biblical culture, they used to offer fire sacrifices. And it was sort of brought to an extremely sophisticated level in India, in terms of the intellectual level, the philosophy of sacrifice, it, the technique. It was, uh, it's actually astonishing if you get into these ancient literatures, the degree of sophistication to which it was brought. But in any case, the Yajur Veda, the word Yajur means a sacrificial formula. So the Rig Veda gives all the hymns, the Yajur Veda explains how you do the sacrifice, what it means, and the symbolism, and so on and so forth. Sama Veda, the very word Sama means uh, sort of the musicology. And so the Sama Veda actually taught how to chant the hymns, the melodies and the meters and so on. The Atarva Veda uh, had different stuff like this, but because the Atarva Veda also had some, I don't know what you'd call it, uh, the ancient Vedic voodoo or something, like you know, if you, if, if, if you want to get your enemy, you can chant this mantra and kind of stuff you see in Indiana Jones movies, you know, the Temple of Doom, that kind of stuff. So, so therefore, often you find the word tri, which means the three, the three used to describe the Vedas, because the fourth Veda was looked at a, a bit askance, even in ancient times, as, you know, this is not quite as spiritual. And, but there are four Vedas. Now, so that's the first level, and as I said, according to linguistic analysis, historical linguistic analysis, this is the oldest layer of this ancient Vedic literature. How old? Yeah. Oh, good question. What happened is, first I'll give you the academic version, which I think is somewhat nonsensical. Uh, what do they call that? I heard that in political terms that they call it layers of... It's like in mathematics, let's say you do a little mathematical thing like an equation and there's a mistake in it or, or simple addition and you make a mistake and then someone else based on what you did calculates something else and then someone else and, and so it just the whole thing is well. so in the 19th century Max Muller a German scholar who, who taught in I think in Oxford uh, made sort of a wild guess that he thought maybe the Big Veda was 3,000 years old and he even said in his writings he said this is a wild guess I really have no idea how old it is but then what happened is another, it's like a telephone, another generation of scholars said, well, Max Muller said it's 3,000 years old and they took it as gospel truth. And then another generation took it and sort of got, it, it got like engraved in stone in the field of Indology. That's how old the Vedas are. And then he forgot the original guy that said it also said, I have no idea if this is true. It's just a wild guess. The tradition itself in India holds these literatures to be much, much older than that. Many, many, many thousands of years older than that. And in, in fact, there's sort of a culture war going on at this very moment between people that take the spiritual culture very seriously, including many scholars, and sort of like the old line Orientalists. Orientalism is a term introduced in a very famous book written about, I guess, about 30, 40 years ago. Uh, and Orientalism is sort of like a, the crude Western take on the East. Like we say, well, in, in Eastern philosophy, they think this, or in the East, when in fact the East is extremely complex and diverse and there's a million different things going on. And so sort of the colonial, overly generalized, almost caricature take on the East, Asia, including the Middle East and the Far East and also India, is called Orientalism. And so the Orientalist view is sort of like the remnants of it is kind of in a culture war with the new generations of scholars and people sympathetic to the spiritual tradition. And the age of the Vedas is one of the flashpoints. It's one of the battlegrounds. What does the language evidence say? Uh, that also is controversial because historical linguistics itself is extremely controversial. There's very little to compare old Sanskrit with. Even ancient Persian is just sort of a dialect of Rig Veda Sanskrit. And so it gets into the whole, it gets into the whole attempt. Well, I'll, I'll give you a very brief version of this. That one gets the other suit. 
because because it's actually a big thing in India. It's, it's a whole big thing going on on the internet and, 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 and universities. The art. Uh, how should I put this? Something is at stake. Something is at stake here because all European languages, except for Basque and, and Finnish and Hungarian, which means you know all the Slavic languages, Germanic languages, Romance languages, including I mean English, Germanic languages. All the European languages, practically, are intimately related to Sanskrit. Ancient Greek is, is it's almost like scary how close it is to ancient Sanskrit. Oh, Indo-European. Exactly. So there's an Indo-European school. Everyone agrees that just like, for example, there's a reason why French and Spanish and Italian, Portuguese and Romanian are very much like Latin. Because Rome had influence in all those areas. And so the idea is that there must be a proto-Indo-European culture that divided somehow but at one time, there was a single language and a single culture. This was a very shocking discovery in, in, in 1790. Sir William Jones, then the governor of East India, under the East India Trading Company, when it was still a private holding, you know, in a lot of India was still a private holding of an English company. He discovered, he was also a linguist, that Sanskrit was intimately related to ancient Greek and Latin and, and so on, and it was an extremely elegant, he said it was even better than Greek and Latin in terms of the elegance of the language, the, the way they preserved uh, grammatical forms and everything. This is a problem for Europe because in those days the whole colonial adventure was based on racism and ethnocentrism. And racism, by the way, by the way all over the world, without exception, was totally respectable back then. Almost up to Hitler. Racism was seen as no more unethical than we see nationalism. I mean, racism is just like a form of nationalism. You know, be true to your school, be true to your country, be true to your race. So before Hitler, racism was very perfectly respectable in this world. So here, here you have a situation where the Euro white Europeans realized that by logic they must have a family relationship to the non-white Indians. And this was shocking to them. And, you know, if you've seen My Fair Lady, you know that the British have always taken language very seriously. And language is one of the key markers of culture, education, social rank. I mean, in England, and in Europe in general, your ability to speak your native language was really the sign of your position in society. And so to discover these non-white people in South Asia had a language more sophisticated than any European language, including even Latin and ancient Greek, which are much more complex than you know, their modern, modern European language, was very shocking. And it launched this whole investigation. into the, it, it created the Indo-European problem or the Indo-European question. Like, where, why are we related to people in India? So, so, when you, so, so this is like one of the key points of this culture war that's going on. If it's a fact, as the Vedic literature teaches, and as Indians will die for on this point, if it's a fact that Vedic culture is indigenous to India, it started there. And by the way, archaeology supports this. Archaeology supports the view that there has never been any significant migration into India at any time in history, at any point in the archaeological record. So if it's a fact that Vedic culture is indigenous to India, and if it's a fact that originally Europe was connected to this, it starts to look like India is the motherland and the Europeans don't want to be from India. So what happened was that, you know, it's just like it was too much. So in the late, so at first, in the early 19th century, as, as Europeans became extremely enthusiastic about Sanskrit, because if you study Sanskrit, you see it's by far the most sophisticated language. When I was at Harvard, I met my, one of my professors who had done Greek and Latin in Stanford and said that you know, Sanskrit is just on a different level. And so in the early 19th century, people were very positive about the thing Sanskrit's the original language. And that was kind of the view, Sanskrit's the original language. Then there was a sort of a, in my view, kind of a Western chauvinistic reaction, backlash against this. So in 1870, I think in Leipzig, there was a linguist named, uh, Sus uh, I forget his name, but there was a whole school of linguists in Leipzig that came up with this theory that Sanskrit's not the original language. Like, hooray, we don't have to be from India anymore. And... Because India was still a colony, it was embarrassing. And, and then they, they kind of, they, they, what happened was they discovered that Hittite, if you know your Bible, you know, the Hittites are always kind of on stage, the Hittites. So the Hitt, Hittite, ancient Hittite, and the Hittites come from central Turkey, by the way. 
They come from central Turkey. And Hittite is an Indo-European language. Although, although Turkish isn't. And so therefore they said, by, by some sort of sophisticated linguistic thing, they said, well, Hittite's older than Sanskrit, so therefore we don't come from India. Hittite, however, is an extremely guttural language. Have you heard of Arabic or Hebrew? There's a lot of <laughs> going on. In, in, like an Arabic and Hebrew. And Hittite is very guttural, which makes you think it's obviously... I, well, anyway, I better stop here. But uh, it gets into this technical linguistic analysis. But this, So you ask, how old is the Rig Veda? I didn't want to give you just like a... I wanted to give you the real answer. My own view, and the view of many scholars who are sympathetic to the spiritual tradition, is that it's very, 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 very ancient. And based on Max Muller's wild guess and subsequent attempts to kind of take away the prestige, because to be very old prestige is like, you know, we've been in business since 1873 or something. There's a certain, like, like the, you know, like the Roman view, old is gold. There's a certain prestige in antiquity. And so there's, it's kind of like that game, keep away, you know, like keep it away from India. Don't let them be too ancient because then, then a certain status accrues to antiquity. So all that's going on. And, and it's really, it's going to be resolved, I think, to some extent in this century. It's not at all resolved. That's the short answer to your question. And it was an oral tradition, correct? Yes, the Rig Veda, as, as my uh, main professor at Harvard used to always say, we actually have like a tape recording going back many, many thousands of years. And, and we talked about this last night. That the sound was considered so important that if you just... Uh, to give one very famous story from the Vedic literature, which everyone knew that studied the Vedas, how important sound is it's that, that the power, the shock is actually in the sound itself, the phony, the exact pronunciation. There's a, um, so I can get this here. There's a compound word, oops, Indra, who's, you know, Zeus, Thor, the god of the atmosphere, rain, thunder, lightning, all that. Indra is Shatru. Indra is the god, Shatru means enemy. So, there's a story about a sage, Twashta. The sage Twashta was very angry at Indra because Indra killed his son. And Indra killed his son for some sort of political expediency to save the world from some bad thing that might have happened. But the sage was still not real happy about it. And so he performed this powerful sacrifice to create this monster who would be Indra Shatru, the enemy of Indra. And, and there's like, and so... In Sanskrit, and, and by the way, Rig Veda Sanskrit has accents on it, which, which drop out later in classical Sanskrit. The Sanskrit, which the Mahabharata and, and, and the uh, Ramayana and all of and so on, Purana. But anyway, so if you say Indra Shatru, with the accent sort of there, it means the enemy of Indra, the mortal, the, the person who can kill Indra. But what happened is when he was, when he was Doing the sacrifice, he accidentally put the accent here. Indra Shatru, which means Indra will be the Shatru. Indra will be the deadly enemy of this guy, and Indra will kill him, which he did. So just because of, just because of a misplaced accent, and I was explaining last night in the talk I gave that, you know, even in English, you can play around with accents like you can say fantastic, or you can say fantastic. And so, just by misplacing the accent, uh, would you, would you be more comfortable with chairs, everyone? Would you be more comfortable with chairs? No, no, no. Okay. So, because the actual phoning, the actual sound, so they memorize the Rig Veda, not only the words, but the accents, and the subtle little things, and the meters, and so on and so forth. And they preserved it because the power was in the sound. And that's the, thing, the whole thing of mantra. But anyway, uh, moving right along, because I, I actually got to do these, these yoga sutras or Lynn may fire me. So, so you, had, you had the Sanghita, this oldest level of literature, but then you had what has been called the Brahman shop talk, like Brahmins talking to Brahmins, sort of liter literature called Brahman literature written by Brahmins for Brahmins, kind of like, 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 it's almost like lawyers writing books for lawyers, doctors writing for lawyers. And the Brahmins talk about the sacrifices and what they mean and how you do them and, 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 and certain legends or myths or, or stories about how certain sacrifices... And so you have this other genre of literature called the Brahmins. Then you have 
literatures which are more mystical theology. They kind of give mystical philosophy and theology and cosmology and so on. Called the Upanishads and the Aranyakas. The word Aranyaka, by the way, is from the word Aranya, forest. The Aranyakas were books theoretically used by sages who had gone out to the forest to practice yoga and meditate and so on. They used this Aranyaka literature. And then the Upanishads, Upa, means near. It's actually the Greek Upo, which is our English hypo, which means less than, but near. So it's the same word. This is Upa, and then Nisha means to sit. So the idea is you sit near the guru and listen. Then you have different sutra literatures, not the Vedanta Sutra, but other kinds of stuff. And, and that's all called Shruti. It was a certain level of literature, the older literature. And this is a distinction which all Hindus recognize. This older literature is called Shruti, which means you hear it. And then there's another literature called Smriti, remembering. You remember the mean of Shruti, and so there's a whole body of Smriti literature. All Hindus recognize these distinctions. It's very ancient, and it's like universally acknowledged, this distinction. And so, for example, the Itihasas, the history, the Puranas, and so on, Mahabharata's Itihasa, the Ramayana, and, and, and the Puranas, the ancient stories, are called Smriti. There's a problem here, though, because some Hindus actually, like, for example, in the 19th century, the Arya Samaj got real, kind of like they were purists, they said, we only want Shruti, we don't want Smriti, we just want the original, pure Vedic literature, not this later literature. The problem with that view is that the Shruti itself acknowledges the Itihas in the front of the later literature as part of the Vedas. In fact, this, the oldest Upanishads, the Chandogya and Brihadaranya Upanishads, call this literature the fifth Veda. Anyway, so that's... Now, we're about to begin the class. So, the, uh, the mantra we're going to chant is from the Isha Upanishad, which means the Upanishad is the Lord. Isha means the Lord. And so, it's... it's, it's the Isha Upanishad is unique among all the Upanishads because it's the only Upanishad which actually is directly part of the Vedic Sanghita. The text of the Isha Upanishad is actually part of the text of this Veda, of, of the Yajur Veda. And no, and no other Upanishad is directly part of the Veda. So it's a very, it's a special Upanishad. It has sort of special standards. That's what I wanted to explain. So... Now we're going to chant this mantra of the Isha Upanishad, even this very ancient Upanishad. So perhaps we can do the words individually and then we can chant together. Uh, Tad, Ajati, Tan, Naijati, Tad, Gure, Tad, Vantike, Vantike. The V is actually a separate little word, which is originally U, U, but it changes the V for certain reasons, so I, you can't really pronounce it by itself. Tad, Antar, Asya, Sarvasya, Tad, U, Sarvasyasya, Bahita. So, Tadejati, Tanayjati, Tadure Tadvantike, Tadure Tadvantike, Tarantarasya Sarvasya, Tarantarasya Sarvasya, Tadu Sarvasya Bayata, Tadu Tanayjati, Tadure Tadvantike, Tadurita Sarvasya, Tadurita Sarvasya, one more time. Tadejati Tanayjati Tadure Tadvantike Tarantarasya Sarvasya Tadu Sarvasyasya Bhaikyata So I translated this very literally for you. Uh, 
it moves, it does not move. It is far and it is near. It is within all of this. It is outside all of this. Speaking about the Lord, but in the, in the neuter form in Sanskrit, tad. So I preserved that neuter form by using it. And uh, anyway, we'll talk about this someday, but it's, uh, it's, it's talking about the Lord. I'm afraid if I dwell on that, it's not going to be any yoga sutra today. So. But there's, I mean, you can see it's a very rich culture. There's a lot to talk about. So, uh, don't let me get too bogged down on the first one, but there's some really interesting cultural anthropology to do on this first one in terms of seeing how people have. <coughs> Bless you. Which is Sanskrit, the Padram Te. So, the first sutra tonight, two. The second part, text 40. So cha, swa anga jugupsa. Again, I've separated the, the words, and it's each word. In Sanskrit, swa and anga become swanga with a long A. But, but it's really the two words. I've separated it so you can see each word. So cha, swa anga jugupsa, paraya sansarga. From cleanliness, so cha, from cleanliness, comes aversion, jugupsa. To one's own body, swaanga, and avoidance of intimate contact, a samsarga, with other bodies, paraya. Now, to talk about aversion to the physical body is extremely uncool in today's culture. And I thought it was interesting, I, I couldn't resist putting a little footnote in there for you to show you how some commentators have kind of like tried to get around this, or some translators, because it's Especially the audiences. I mean, if, if you if you translate the Yoga Sutras, you're probably writing in the West to sort of New Age audience, and they don't want to hear things like, you know, the body's bad. So I thought it was interesting how they avoid that. So first, I gave you the de- the, the definition of Jugupsa in the standard Sanskrit English dictionary by, by Monier Williams, which is dislike, abhorrence, disgust. Now Feuerstein, in his edition. He puts in his commentary that commonly translated with disgust, perhaps because that's what it means, <laughs> the interesting term jugupsa really conveys a more positive idea, namely that of being, whoops, sorry, on one's guard, left that on, on one's guard with respect to the body of having a detached attitude towards our mortal frame. I mean, it's not wrong what he said. I, I don't want to say that what he said is wrong, but he, he has kind of always really softened the blow, as you can see, which is interesting in itself, and what it says about our culture. And then uh, Barbara Stoller Miller, who, until she passed away in 1993, was a distinguished uh, teacher of Hinduism at Columbia, Barnard College at Columbia. She translated, she's the only one that had the guts to do it straight. She said, aversion to one's, oh my God, what's I doing there? Aversion to one's body. The purifi- and then she writes in her commentary, the purification of the body makes one aware of its imperfections and the absurdity of attachment to it. This cultivation of aversion to the body also gives the yogi a distaste for physical contact with others and increases an inward focus. The Yanger, of course a very famous yoga teacher, also kind of avoids the, the full brunt of this word jagusa. And he says, quote, Cleanliness of body and mind develops, because this comes from Shocha, from cleanliness. Cleanliness of body and mind develops disinterest in contact with others for self gratification. Swaanga Jugupsa. Taking all this together, I, I, I'm pretty sure what it means is that not literally that you despise your body. So, in that sense, what you're seeing, I think, is right to soften it a bit. It, it's not just that you despise your body. Uh, because the body, after all, is also a creation of God. And, and the physical elements of the body are ultimately just the divine energy of God. So it's not, it's not that you actually despise the molecules and, and you know, the skin. But, but what's disgu- despised here, I think, is taking the body as the self, taking the body to be the real you, and trying to, or trying to exploit the body. It, it's this attitude of trying to exploit the body through greed, through lust, through vanity. And, and so, if, let's say, I've lived my life, I've been a normal person, I'm trying to enjoy and exploit my body, 
and I'm into my body. And then suddenly I realize, socha, from cleanliness, from purity, that actually I'm not the body. The body is, is God's creation, but I'm something far, far greater. I'm an eternal, divine being. I am part of God. I have a divine nature. And I have fantastic spiritual powers if I would just access them. So at that point, my attempt to exploit what is ultimately dead matter becomes abominable. Not the physical body itself, but kind of like that, that attitude I had toward it. I begin to see it as abhorrent, which is what the word Jugutsa means. And samsarga. Samsarga means intimate contact. It can mean sexual intercourse, which it often does. So, but in general it means, you know, intimate contact. Samsarga. And so, from this cleanliness purity, one's attitude becomes a samsarga, not having that type of intimate or sexual contact, parayar, with others, parayar means with others, in this context we would take to mean with other people, with other bodies. And so, there are other yoga systems, like for example, bhakti yoga, Yay. <laughs> bhakti yoga, where, <laughs> where there's really no harm in sexuality, if it's done spiritually, which doesn't just mean mystical, it means that it's really done as, as devotion to God. Because after all, potentially we'll say that Ishwara, that uh, Samadhi Siddhi, Ishwara Paridhan, that the perfection of Samadhi, which is the perfection of yoga, the perfection of the perfection of yoga is devotion to God. So, and Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita that Dharma Virudha Konteya Kamosmi Vardarja I myself, God, God appears within or identifies with that sexual <coughs> act which does not subvert virtue, which does not subvert religious virtue. For example, a man and woman together procreating would be, that's how the tradition would understand that. But that sexual act is divine. It's actually an act of God. Or, or God is present in that act. And so therefore, Patanjali is talking to people basically, and he's coaching people that have gone, gone out to the mountains, and they've given up the world, and they're just going to you know, sit down for a few hundred years, they can do the pranayama, right? And, and meditate. And so what's interesting is there were types of yoga that demanded celibacy. There were other types of yoga which were equally powerful, which were much more liberal on these things. And so there's that whole world of yoga. And obviously for our age, I think the more liberal yogas, we still have something to learn from. We have a lot to learn from potentially. But ultimately... The original, the very ancient Ashtanga Yoga system was something generally done in isolation, not in the association of others, and with strict celibacy. There were other forms of yoga, which also used the asanas to some extent and so on, that had a much more social and liberal view, but were equally or even more powerful. And that's what's explained in, in the Gita. And that's what potentially hints at by saying that ultimately the highest perfection of yoga is devotion to God. Anyway, so that's the first, that's the opening, the opening shot here over the bow. So Chatsalam de Jugupsa, Praya Samsara, then potentially says, Sakva Shuddhi, Somanasya, Ekagri, Indriya, Jaya, Atma, Darshan, and Yogi, Twani, Jaya. And I put the three dots because this is more good stuff that comes from cleanliness. So cleanliness leads to godliness in the yoga service. So more good stuff that comes from cleanliness is Sakva Shuddhi, the purification of your existence. Somanasya, to be cheerful, literally from sumanas, which means sort of a good mind, having a good mind, a positive mind. So somanasya means sort of, you know, positive thinker, cheerful, happy, and so on. Somanasya, ekagriya, agra means point, ekagra means one point, focus. Ekagra means like one pointedness, or I can't say focus. In other words, not having your, not being spaced out, being focused, being concentrated. Your, your mind is strong and disciplined. And jaya, indriya jaya, uh, victory over your senses, because you know, the senses want to take us all over the galaxy, really. Our senses have all kinds of desires and, and winds and impulses, and so the yogi has to conquer the senses. Conquer doesn't mean you destroy them or reject them, it just means it's like your car. It's in your self interest to have control over your car when it's moving. And so the body is moving, and it's in our interest to have control over it. 
And that's what he's talking about. Indriya Jaya. Atma Darshana. Seeing yourself. Seeing the self. Atma Darshana. Yogi Twani. And uh, Yogi Twani means like qualification. Yoga in Sanskrit often means application, like Sankhya Yoga. Sankhya means the theory, the philosophy. Yoga, the application. Yogya. I don't know why there. It's sort of like able in English, like applicable. And so yoga means sort of applicable, and twa means ness, so it's applicableness. Or, which I sort of translate qualification. It, it kind of means it in this sense, like applicable in the sense that you're qualified for it, you have the ability to do it, and so on. So, that was my... That's how I did it. So, so all these things come from, from cleanliness, from purity. Cleanliness of mind, cleanliness of body. And so on. So purity is very important. And we're concerned now with like pure water, pure air. What's the of a pure mind and a pure heart? I mean, it's kind of silly to drink pure water and try to breathe pure air and then have your have all kinds of stuff in your mind. That's you know shouldn't be there. So then, by the way, these are the niyamas. Patanjali gave previously the list of the niyamas, the observances, the second stage of Ashtanga Yoga. The second anga, the second limb of yoga. The first was yama, the restraints. The second limb is the observances, the niyamas. And so the first niyama is shocha, cleanliness, and these are all the great things that come if you do this niyama. The second niyama is santosha, satisfaction. It's interesting. This is a, what does it mean like satisfaction is an observance? Because let's say you're in traffic and someone cuts you off, and, and like me, you're from L.A. There's sort of an impulse to signal that person in a particular way. And so, to be satisfied when the world is not, I mean, I mean, you can have a great life, you can have a super life, but the world itself is, you know what the world's like. It's very imperfect. I mean, politically, economically, environmentally, it's just, there's all kinds of stuff out there that isn't so great. And so, if in the face of, in the face of a very imperfect world, and considering the fact that we have unfulfilled desires and we have bad habits and we have you know, all, all this impurity, you can still manage to find satisfaction. That's considered an act of surrender to God. Because to find satisfaction, you have to accept that whatever is happening to you, not your choices, but what is happening to you, is somehow the grace of God. To teach us. Even the bad stuff... It's mercy because it teaches us, it forces us to see things that we might not have wanted to see. But to somehow find satisfaction in the midst of everything is considered to be a, 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 an act of spiritual discipline. Because it kind of rules out rage and lust and greed. And Because if, if I'm lusty and greedy, I'm not satisfied. I intentionally want something I haven't got. If I'm, if I'm very upset because someone didn't respect me, that's not satisfaction because... So if you think about it, to keep yourself satisfied is, is actually a very serious spiritual act. Yes? So this is translated as contentment very often, isn't it? Is right. I think that's synonymous. Okay. Tosha itself is satisfaction. It comes from the root tush, to be to be satisfied and so, or, or, or content. I think it's synonymous. Again, in Sanskrit, it, it has no direct English word. It's like if you say in Spanish, satisfaction, the obvious translation is satisfaction. But if you say Santosha in Sanskrit, it's, it's not just a cognate word. So, and then, now here, it, 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 Patanjali says, from satisfaction or contentment, the anuttama, sukha lava. Sukha is happiness, lava means achievement, and anuttama means there's nothing better. Uttama means the greatest. So anuttama means there's nothing greater than this. Anuttama. Nothing greater. So the, the achievement of happiness, an achievement of happiness which has no, nothing beyond it, that comes from santosha. This is, by the way, this fact that unless you're satisfied, you can't have real happiness is also mentioned in the Gita. In the Gita, the Gita, Krishna says, what is that? that um, Ashantasya kutaksukam. 
For the unsatisfied person, ashanta, shanti means peace or the unpeaceful person. For the person that's not peaceful, ashanta. Ashantasya, kutasukam. Where's the happiness? It's a rhetorical question, means life. There's no question of happiness. So therefore, there's another word in Sanskrit, harsha. And harsha is often given as something you want to transcend. Harsha, I think, could be translated in English as excitement. Like you say, I'm so excited about that. That's not happiness in this yoga culture. In fact, you'll hear often in these literatures, we have to transcend duality. Dwandva, duality. Like these polarities, like uh, victory and defeat. I get all happy if I'm victorious, if I'm defeated, I'm depressed. You know, I'll fall on my sword or something like, I guess like Mark Anthony. I don't know. So, but these dualities, you have to transcend. It's a common theme in the literature. And so harsha, is, it's antonym, it's opposite, it's always given a shoka, lamentation, like getting excited about things and then crashing, being depressed, lamenting. And so, it, being excited about something, I mean, it's, it's not a peaceful state. So the kind of excitement, which is not really peaceful, is not considered to be real happiness. That's the idea. Real happiness is based on virtue, it, it comes in a, a serene state. It's not just excitement. So that's what he's talking about here, by happiness. Then, oops, oh, actually I'm making up some time here. Kaya Indriya Siddhir Ashudikshaya Tapasaha. Now, austerity is one of the niyamas. So here's what comes, so Tapasaha means from austerity. This is what comes from austerity. Uh, you get siddhi, perfection, of kaya, the body, and the senses. The body and the senses. And this comes from ashudhi, chaya, destroying impurity. Destroying impurity. So this is not the kind of austerity which harms your body. This is a very important point. Because sometimes there's a story about yogis that almost starve themselves back to the best example is Hiranya Kashipu, who's this great demon. He's, he's like the super classic demon of, of ancient Indian literature. And he actually took over the universe and was going to, he was evil and finally was defeated by a very famous incarnation of Vishnu called Narsimha. It's a very, very famous story in Hindu culture. It's one, it's one of like the most famous stories. But Hiranya Kashipu, to get power, he performed austerity. He, he stood on one leg and he fasted. And he performed such severe austerities that said ultimately there was nothing left of his physical body but the skeleton. And he kept his prana, he kept his vital air circulating in his bones. And that's all that was left of him. But he just kept going. So it's like this ridiculous austerity. And he got power over the universe, but then of course he was defeated because he was a bad guy. Yes? I understood tapas as meaning uh, burning desire. It, I think it's been translated. I haven't got the foggiest idea how some people became inspired to translate it that way. Because if you look at all the Vedic literature, where you actually see real yogis, all the stories and histories of all the yogis and ascetics, the word tapas always means austerity, fasting, uh, sexual abstinence. It, it, that's just what it always means. So the idea, and, and so again, I think maybe some modern translators that wanted to appeal to a certain New Age crowd that wasn't terribly interested in austerity, they kind of, because the word tapas literally means heat. It comes from the verb tap, which means to burn. Like for example, uh, Surya, Surya's tapati, the sun that heats. The sun is heating the world. So the verb tapati. So, but again, in all the literature, it means austerity, you know, the volunteer, voluntarily accepting some physical inconvenience. How does that heat apply to austerity? Well, it's kind of like the fire of austerity, it's sort of like, you know, the fire of austerity. But, the, but as a burning desire, it's, 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 that's just not the way it appears in the literature. Like I said, there's, there's hundreds of examples of yogis and ascetics and the word always means that. It always means whatever voluntary austerity it took on. So that's kind of, yeah, that's kind of an amazing translation, burning desire. Was there, was there a question, someone? Yeah, I was going to ask, like, you, you stopping your eating or sexual abstinence, isn't that yeah. burning your desire or eating or 
burning up the desire, you mean? No, I mean, stopping your desire. Of right. Well, it, it's like a fight. I mean, if you fast, you, you feel it. It's, it's not steady. It's stopping your desire, isn't it? Well, it's stopping your desire. Not necessarily. Austerity, it means stopping the activity. The desire may still be there, and that's why it kind of burns. It's the, 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 not that as soon as you decide not to eat, hey, like I declare, okay, tomorrow I'm going to fast, and I wake up, hey, I don't want to eat. No, I do want to eat. <laughs> Actually, I enjoy food. And so, on a fast day, it's, it's not that the desire goes away, it's an, that's why it's an austerity. If you didn't want it, it wouldn't be an austerity. So, what's the difference between stopping an activity and transcending all of yeah, well, yeah, Krishna, there's a very interesting statement about this in the Bhagavad Gita where Krishna says that um, if you merely give up the activity, you really still want it. But if you get a higher taste, if you experience something higher, then you can really give it up. But even in the stage of practice, we're not, when we're not fully transcended, there are just certain things you can't do. I mean, for example, we become angry at people, but we can't, you know, we, we can't attack them. Or I may be in a hurry, but I've got to stop at this red light even though there's no cars around for miles. But so just to be a civilized person, lady or gentleman, you have to... You can't do everything you feel like doing. And, and similarly, the yoga practice, one had to follow very strict moral standards to be in the game. And, and those are the yamas. Those are the yamas. And, and, and there, was, there were always austerities associated with yoga. It was always like that. Now, in the Gita, though, Krishna says, if you perform an austerity which actually harms your body, that's an ignorant act. Krishna says, that's actually a, an evil act. If you actually harm the body, so austerity can't go to the point of harming the body or, or damaging your health. That's considered to be uh, evil. So you have to keep your body healthy, but we have to accept some little austerity. Uh... Then Swadhyaya Isha Devata Sankra Yoga from studying sacred text, Swadhyaya. One has communion, which is sort of Sankra Yoga, the word yoga, linking, connecting. Sankra Yoga, communion with one's desired deity. And the idea here is that the Lord sort of appears to people, reciprocates to people according to their desire to worship Him in a certain way. And so, I mean, even in certain religious traditions, I mean, like there's, you know, there's the angry, jealous God, there's the God of love, there's... And, and so, and in India, they had this pantheon of different forms of the di divinity and so on, and so people had the, the, this uh, opportunity to worship the divine in a way that made sense to them. And they've always had this understanding that that's why there's different religions, because people have different inclinations to worship God in different ways, and so they were always quite liberal about this. Although... Like everything else, you can go to an extreme where one becomes whimsical and kind of just sort of makes up something like I worship the great pumpkin that created the universe. So it's, it's not a free-for-all. It's not unlimited that you can just do anything. But there was, it was a liberal tradition that recognized that people worship God in different ways. And so therefore, the, this is a very common term, by the way, ishta, from the verb ish, to desire. So ishta means desire or preferred, or favored. So, Ishta and Deva means God, with a capital or a small g, depending on the context. And Ta is like, is like the T in divinity. It's sort of like the English word divinity, Deva Ta, means the same thing. So, the Ishta, Deva Ta, your preferred divinity. And so, yes. Uh, in the pantheon, uh, was there one God that didn't... Uh That's interesting, Roman customs. There wasn't so much like, you know, the sort of like the altar for the unknown deity. But um, it, it, you mentioned faith. There is actually a statement in the Upanishad where, where a prayer is offered that, uh, uh, how's that go? Hiran mayena patrena satya syapihi tam hukam. That a prayer to God that your face is covered by, your, by this brilliant effulgence. Therefore, Tapped on pollution apartment, please remove this covering so that I can actually see the, the face of God. So, 
That's very interesting. Maybe, maybe, very interesting discussion. Vedic theology. I mean, the whole how they conceive of divinity and everything. That's a fascinating topic. If I wasn't late, I would uh, for a very important day. So, maybe I'll just do a couple more and then. So, very interesting. Do you think what's the connection? How is it by studying these scriptures? You're united with, or come together with your desired deed. It's an interesting concept that you can think about. Mm-hmm. Then Stila Suf- Well, that's the end of that section, actually. Because now we're going to go into Stila Sukhamasana. Your seat, your yoga seat, should be firm but also comfortable. Sukhamasana means happy. So that a happy seat in Sanskrit means it's something. It means sort of like a comfortable seat. That's how they say a comfortable seat. Yes. Um, you skip over 2.45? Oh. Oh my God. Yeah, if I were heathen. I'm sorry. Yeah, that, that's one of the great verses of the, one of the great sutras. Sorry. That's about my skit that you're calling my attention to focus more attention on. Samadhi Siddha Ishwara Paridana. This is one of the niyamas, one of the observances, dedication to God, literally to the Lord. Ishwara means you know, like the Lord. And Samadhi is the eighth stage that we said about Ashtanga Yoga, Ashta Anga, Ocho, Ashta, the eight limbs of yoga, and the eighth limb, the Ashtama Anga, you could say, eight, Ashtama in Sanskrit means the eighth. So the Ashtama Anga of Ashtanga, the eighth limb is Samadhi, trance or complete enlightenment. And here, but there are stages of Samadhi. And here, potentially, it says Samadhi City, the perfect Perfection of samadhi, the perfection of the perfection of yoga is Ishwara Panidana. Dedication to God. Dedication to the Lord. Quite quiet. It's right there in black and white. Unadulterated. And the bridge. So, should we stop here? Or, or not? Let's do a couple more. Okay, sure. So, interesting. In other words, if you're on a yoga seat, it's just like real firm, it's not comfortable, it's not going to be a great yoga practice. On the other hand, if you get too comfortable, it's, you, know, you can't just like lounge. So it's interesting, these two things. It has to be firm, your seat has to be firm, and comfortable, which kind of applies to spiritual practice in general. It has to be firm and disciplined, but it has to be comfortable for you. So it's kind of it kind of applies to spirituality and or a good life in general. And it applies to all the asanas. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, just talking about asana, definitely. Firm, but comfortable. So then, prayatna shaitilya ananta samapati bhyam. This is achieved, is the idea, by relaxing. Shaitilya means relaxing. One's effort, prayatna, and becoming like ananta. The word ananta literally means uh, without end. Ant is end in English, cognate word. And anant means unending. But it's also the name of a particular form of Vishnu, who actually, Vishnu kind of manifests, who's, who's this many-headed cosmic serpent. And if you know your world mythology, the cosmic serpent is a popular figure. And Ananta, sort of with his coils, he forms a bed, like a seat, an asana for Vishnu. That's very interesting because Vishnu, who has a very special position in the Vedas, that's I, I did a paper on this at UCLA, actually, I, at the Indo European Department, when I was there in the Indo European Department. Vishnu has a very special position in the Vedas. Another topic. But anyway, <laughs> okay, I'll, okay, very briefly. And there, there's one, what was his name? I'm so rusty now. There's one great Dutch Sanskrit scholar. His name was, uh, oh, God, slipped on. But anyway, uh, he wrote this fascinating paper. He's one, of the, he's one of the great, I think, endologists of the second half of the 20th century, Sanskrit from Holland, and uh, in which he explains that the Rig Veda, which has a lot of hymns in which you pray for material things, you get material benefits, and, and a lot of hymns to Indra. It was sort of like the chief of the nature god, you could say. But there's sort of there, there's there's a single transcendental moment, an explicit transcendental moment in the Rig Veda, where it said, which is one of the most famous, perhaps the most famous Rig Veda verse in Hinduism, 
which is Omta Vishnu Paramang Padam Sadat Pashanti Surya, that the godly people are always looking toward that uh, supreme abode or supreme position of Vishnu. So the godly, the god himself is looking toward that. And in the Vedas themselves, the Yajur Veda, in the Vedas themselves, there is this sort of powerful, shocking statement that uh, that yadyo yadno vai Vishnu, that Vishnu is the sacrifice. So that Vishnu is not only an object of sacrifice, but the whole spiritual experience. And sacrifice isn't simply offering oblations into fire. Sacrifice means ultimately anything you offer to God. It can be your yoga practice, it can be your love, it can be your whatever. So sacrifice is the universal act of offering to the divine. And in that context, it's actually said in the original Vedas that the sacrifice is Vishnu. So that every sacrifice really is to Vishnu. So that's the whole... And, and then the last uh, point I'll give you, because this whole thing, you know, the, the, the trinity, the three deities of Hinduism is a later understanding and it's, it's, it's a somewhat sloppy understanding, actually. Especially if you think they're all the same, because they're not. They're different. So sort of a... Anyway, it, it's, it's, a, it's a somewhat crude, pop pop Hindu concept that in Hinduism there are three gods. Another point is that in the Rig Veda, in the tenth book of the Rig, the last book of the Rig Veda, you have a, 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 an extremely important, famous hymn. These are like the, the pillars, really, of, of Hinduism, called the Purusha Sutta. Sutta literally means well-spoken, Su'ukta. And uh, Purusha, the, the hymn to the Purusha, which means the person, in this case, the divine person, and in this hymn, the entire universe is, you meditate upon the entire universe as located in the body of God. And this Purusha, from the earliest times, was understood to be Vishnu. That, and the gods, the gods themselves, are on the body of God. With a capital G. And so, in terms of that uh, most famous Rig Veda hymn, Tad Vishnu Panam Padam, that, that even the gods and the godly look toward the abode of Vishnu and uh, the tenth book, the Purusha Sukti hymn and the special prestige, the special ontological and theological status given to Vishnu in the Vedas that he is a sacrifice. Uh, and in the... One last bit of evidence, actually. The Brahman literature, going back to this Brahman literature, I guess you get an idea it's a very rich culture. If you look at this Brahman literature, which is commentary, it's the oldest existing commentary in the Vedas themselves. This is commentary going back thousands of years. And it's commentary from within the school. Each of the four Vedas was entrusted to a particular like, extended Brahminical family or community. And they pass it down from generation to generation. They kind of like, they didn't own the Vedas in a, in a uh, uh, what I say, a uh, consumerist notion sense. But, but they were authorities for those Vedas. You had to study them. So the Rig Veda, everyone realizes the oldest Sanskrit that exists is the Sanskrit of the Rig Veda. And thousands of years ago, the Brahmin community that had the Rig Veda was their Veda. You had to go to them if you want to study the Rig Veda. That community wrote a Brahmin literature on the Rig Veda, the Aitareya Brahman. There's another one too, but the oldest... So the oldest commentary and oldest Veda is called the Aitareya Brahman, way back thousands of years, written by the people who, it was their Veda. The very first statement of the Aitareya Brahman, which is a book, the very first statement is, of all the gods, Vishnu is the highest. So Vishnu, forever, I mean, for thousands of years, then it came to be understood was Krishna. I mean, Krishna and Vishnu are talking about the same deity. So, so therefore, the worship of Vishnu or Krishna, also Indian scholars in India, I mean, in South India, where you have the oldest temples in India, they also, it, it, it's commonly thought that the oldest temples in India were temples of Vishnu. And I go on and on and on and on. So, it, so again, the, Brahm, the idea that, that in Hinduism they just have three gods is, is a somewhat crude understanding, sort of, sort of pop Hinduism. So Ananda, is the seat, the awesome of Vishnu. And so you'll see, then if you see, you know, Hindu art and those, you know, Hindu religious posters that you see all over the place, mm -hmm. 
you'll often see Vishnu, the form, you know, Krishna or Vishnu with four arms, and he's sitting on this, the coils of the serpent who's also behind him, mm-hmm. above him like that. So that serpent who's behind and above Vishnu and who forms his asana with his coils, that's an asana. But what this verse is saying is, again, remember the sthira sukhamata, your posture has to be firm but comfortable. You have to be like an anta. You have to be like an anta, who's the seed of, like his, the seed he provides for Vishnu. And you have to relax your effort. In other words, like, I mean, some people here are yoga teachers, you know much better than I do, that if someone is like straining too much, it's, that's not really how you do it, isn't it? I mean, so, so is, and that's true, isn't it? Yeah. And you can't be like, just grimacing during the whole posture and everything. <laughs> and so that's what he's saying here. Shaitili, relaxing your effort. Don't try too hard. And be kind of like Ananda, who just sort of naturally provides the seat. <laughs> so please keep the second sheet, because like, next time, save the trees. <laughs> <laughs> and the next line kind of ends it, right? Uh... Okay, you're right. You're you're actually right. That's a tato, which literally means from that or thus or then. Dwandwa, duality, anabigata. Literally, you won't be struck because gata actually means striking. It can mean even like slaying. So gata means striking. So I've been unaffected. That, then one is unaffected by duality. That that's a mild translation. I couldn't think of an English word, but it really means like you won't be struck by it. It won't get you. By these dualities, which means if things go well, I'm happy. If they don't go well, I'm depressed. Or if I win, I'm great. If I lose, I'm depressed. It's too hot. You've got all these dualities. Victory, defeat, loss, and gain. But Dante says you won't be affected by them if you do all this stuff and you're sitting comfortably and you know, all the other stuff we talked about. So, you can see it's a very uh, profound culture. There's a lot going on here. And, and the stuff I'm talking about are things which, in this culture, everyone knew these things. I'm really just discussing very basic, general points that everyone, even say I mean, people were familiar with. I'm not really giving like esoteric points or points which are from a particular school. These, these are very basic parts of the culture that everyone understood. So, thank you very much.